for uh, both uh, my position and public health in general, definitely prioritizing gaining a, a vast array of experiences. So do internships, volunteer, engage in activities, events, opportunities to network, and, and don't be afraid to try out different roles simultaneously. As we talked about for years, I've held positions at the same time. Obviously, that I, those aren't concurrent. Those aren't sequential. Those are all happening at the same time often. Uh, and, and I feel like that's key to growing a large experience base at a young age. And I think it's critical to be very intentional uh, or having a very intentional uh, tenacity for gaining experience while you're in school. Uh, don't wait until, uh-oh, it's senior year. Um, I need an internship. Oh, don't wait that long. <laughs> Go ahead and get started like sophomore year, junior year. And of course, to the extent that you're able. Uh, of course, be mindful of burning yourself out and your mental health, absolutely. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Welcome to Public Health Careers. In today's episode, you'll hear more about one, how to gain a broad range of experiences as a young health equity and public health practitioner and researcher. Two, the importance of using LinkedIn for opportunities and connections and following up with people. And three, using her life mission to find places of impact to move health equity forward through research and action and deciding to pursue a doctorate program. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date with great content like today's episode. Leave a five-star review as well as share this with someone or somewhere where people can get some value from it as well as learn about different paths and experiences in public health. If you'd like to support the platform, the Public Health Millennial, Public Health Careers Podcast, be sure to check out that link below to support either as a one-time contributor or a monthly contributor. Greatly, greatly appreciate that and be sure to share this with someone. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hey. This is Usley McCullers, and I'm an aspiring health equity researcher and change maker, and you're listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have an aspiring public health leader with a passion for health equity, social justice, helping others, and spreading joy. She can food a bachelor's in biology from Townsend University and is a current master of public health candidate at the University of Delaware. She works in many roles, which include health equity research associate at MedStar Health, graduate research assistant, founder, director of Leaders at Equity, Access and Diversity in Public Health, as well as in an associate student contributor with the Public Health Millennial. She is currently applying for public health PhD programs and is searching for health equity and practice opportunities. We have Usley McCullers, BS. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here <laughs> after all this time being on the show. I'm, I'm so honored. Thank you. It is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. I'm trying to get my chair inside to you. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I always feel to do that like in a very nice way, but <laughs> we got you in the show. Welcome, welcome to the. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad to have you in the show. Um, so first and foremost, how do you identify and how are you doing? Sure. Yeah. Again, my name is Asli McCullers. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as an African American woman. Awesome. And how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm excited. I'm I'm hopeful. It was just spring break. Um, so rest, but also doing a lot of exploring for PhD programs, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Uh, so a lot of decision making happening, but spring break, so no homework. Uh, so I'm feeling feeling sunshiny. <laughs> awesome. No homework is always a plus. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Anytime. And before we get more into your your collegiate story, what does public health mean to you? Yeah, this is this is an amazing question. Um, I think for me. Um, public health means protecting and advancing the wellness, like the state of being well, um, the state of being healthy for all people. So, uh, so that where we see it on a, a public basis, public health is a, a people facing discipline and it's work that I feel like sits in, um, service. It sits in kindness and, um, a commitment to the desire to support policies, um, research interventions that that bolster health for all people and regardless of their social positioning. And of course that pulls health equity into the conversation and 
which for me uh, means bringing social justice and public health together. Well said, well said. And, <laughs> o- and o- also in, in your intro, you, you talk about, or I spoke about you being someone that spreads joy. What, what are some ways that you, that you actively work to spread joy? Oh my gosh, yeah, I mean, uh, beyond just service and again, that commitment to kindness, I, I hope that my energy and uh, just kind of the spirit of, of, of spreading, I, I call it sunshine, being sunshiny, uh, to others. I, I hope that that alone helps uh, positively impact the people around me. And just like showing that sense of community care and that dedication to community care is, you know, how I hope that I embody uh, spreading joy in my work. Uh, it's Life is too dark and it's too short to, to not be intentional about spreading joy to others. So um, I try to make that actionable in, in my conduct to life and the work that I do and just the aura that I bring into a room. Love that. Love that. And um, and I would say firstly that yes, you spread joy, like working with you is a pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad that you have like this enthusiasm and happiness to you. <laughs> and I definitely feel that joy. I, I feel like that uh, a lot, does a lot of that, that come or stem from like bell hooks and her understanding of like love or, or not so much. Yeah. I mean, I actually have not read like super deeply into bell hooks. I know that very, very influential work, but uh, I should, I should get more into that, but, but no, it's, <laughs> that's just the way I am. But okay. I, love it. Love I it. I should ground that in some, some, some theory. That'd be great. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but I, I just like the fact of like making it actionable because so many of us <laughs> don't think about it as actionable. We think about it like just happening to us, but like making it actionable actually means that I can actively do something to spread this joy and do joy and, and like bring more sunshine, as you said, into the world. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I recommend Bell Hooks if, if you're interested in reading yes, something. I, I've gotten many recommendations for Bell Hooks. It's, it's about that time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You're going to see a PhD program as well. So, so you, you, you got to find time as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right, right, right. Okay, so you, you got your bachelor's in biology in functional biology of animals from Townsend University. So going into undergrad, what was, what was that thought process as, as you got into there? Yeah. Do, do you mean uh, the school or the program? Both. Yeah. Um, the school, that was, that was quite a process. That was, wow. <laughs> Looking at high school and what, what I originally thought I wanted to do. I was very much so like sophomore year, junior year. I was like, I got to go to an Ivy league. My sister and I were like very deep set on like, we got to go to like UPenn or something like that. And I think that um, got the SAT scores back. And they were like, I don't know if that's UPenn SAT scores. And my parents were like, well, you're not retaking it because it was expensive to take the SAT. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, you know, we're going to work with what we got. So uh, we applied to University of Maryland, um, UNC, uh, Towson, George Mason, and Hampton. And we, we did get into all the schools we applied to, which was super awesome. But we had a hard decision to make because... I think that Towson really stole, and when I say, I'm going to probably say we and our, I do have an identical twin. Uh, so any decisions like pre my post back, we, we made together. Um, so if I say we, that's who I'm referring to. Um, but... <laughs> I was go- I was going to pr- prompt you if, if you didn't say that. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I forget that people, do, like, because we do different things now, we go to different schools now, I forget that people don't know we're twins. Like, they don't even know I have one. I assume they know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, by the way, I have an identical twin and we used to do everything together. So it's I'm still transitioning. And but anyway, um, we we definitely fell in love with Towson. Like it was weird because in the state of Maryland, and I don't want to say weird, but it was definitely an interesting uh, experience because in Maryland, um, at least back then, I don't know anymore, but in Maryland, uh, sort of like the the main school that you want to get into is UMD. Uh, and then when you think about UNC, that's like a public Ivy and stuff like that. And people are like, why do you want to go to Towson if you got into UNC, if you got into UMD? But sometimes I, I remember my mom once said, you're going to walk on the campus and you're just going to know. You're going to be like, I'm home. And my sister and I both really genuinely felt that at Towson. We felt like we had the access to resources that we needed. We felt like it was the right size. Um, we felt like um, we had access to the activities that we were involved in. My sister and I were both in marching band. Uh, all through high school and then all through college. And uh, we got to have that experience at Towson. Uh, and it was just really, really special. We just, sometimes you just have a feeling, you know, what's right for you. Uh, so we kind of had this like push and pull with like family members and community members. Like, why would you want to go to Towson? If you got into UNC, if you got into UMD, what's wrong with y'all? And we just like knew like, <laughs> we, like the rankings don't mean everything. Sometimes right. it goes so much more beyond, you know, what 
this list that's made by some people you don't even know uh, are saying about the school. It, it's <laughs> there's there's so much depth to the decision of especially for undergrad because I mean that's some core years of your life and you really need to pick what feels right for you. Um, so that was what went into that decision. There's a lot of heart that went into the decision to go to Towson. Uh, definitely don't regret it. Best four years of my life. Well, hopefully, hopefully I have a better four years of my life. Hopefully yes, I yeah, my- for now. Yeah, right. for now. But- <laughs> right, right. For now. Uh, but, you know, only up from here, of course. And as far as why I studied biology, definitely <laughs> grew up in a, a pro-STEM household. My parents uh, were both scientists in the military. Um, so they, they definitely were huge, you know, encouragers of STEM. At the time, I didn't have any other like things I was like sure I wanted to do. Um, I was also a musician. I feel like I also am still a musician. I always say was, but you know, as I can see, as you can see, I still have instrumentation in that's, my that's awesome. In my room, but I'm no longer a performing <laughs> musician. Uh, but back then, right I was, now, I was, yeah, exactly. I was an active musician at the time, but I knew I didn't even want to study that uh, mm-hmm. because I wanted that to still be like a hobby and like a safe space. So I didn't want to study it and get paid to do it. Uh, so at that point, I was like, well, I mean, I didn't do bad and like AP. Well, I did okay in AP Chem, but I did okay. I did pretty good in like bio and stuff like that. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, let's do the STEM thing. Uh, so we, uh, again, we, my sister and I both decided to study biology. We minored in music. Um, and and uh, that, that was kind of the, the main reason why we just had encouragement to do it and um, uh, just felt like it was the right direction to go at the time. Uh, and I can definitely talk more about that transition into public health, but that's what that looked like as far as undergrad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that and giving perspective onto your in into your life. And I could imagine because I, 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 I had, during my undergrad, I also had a friend who were twins, and yeah, they would they, they were very similar in in seeing we and like just like automatically thinking that everyone knows that you have a twin, yeah. <laughs> which, which like makes sense. It makes sense from your perspective because like she's probably been there all the time for right. for a very long time. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But, but I, I appreciate uh, sharing you sharing that and, and that thought process. And yeah, I feel like that that makes sense. A lot of us are like, OK, what did I do good in during high school? Let me do something similar to that in, mm-hmm. in university. And what about the functional biology part of an, functional biology of animals? Was was that like a concentration or, or yeah, what? it was a concentration, but it, it like, <laughs> didn't, I mean, it did, didn't really that. mean much. Right. Yeah, it didn't mean it. it just, I don't even know why it was called that because there was no like specific focus in like, like veterinary side. Okay. It just was called that. So, okay. Yeah. Cause that, 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 that's what I thought where, where you were going at first, <laughs> but yeah, I guess not. No, no animals involved. I never worked <laughs> okay. with any uh, live models or anything like that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, and be, before I ask you, well, actually let's get into some of the jobs. So you're a peer leader at Townsend Opportunities in STEM, as well as an inpatient oncology clinical volunteer. So can you talk about those two experiences that you had? And you have a couple other experiences during your undergrad, and I'm just trying to lump them together. So you don't have to answer all of them like specifically. Sure. But, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, there is a program that my sister and I uh, both wanted to do coming in the summer of our freshman year of college. And it was called Towson Opportunities in STEM or TOPS. Uh, and it was sort of a um, sort of summer experience program for students from marginalized or disadvantaged backgrounds or from, I think there were there were some criteria. They could be from Baltimore City. Uh, they could be like um, first generation students. Um, so sort of a uh, sort of an upward bound type of setup. Uh, and it was really, really great to kind of give that first exposure to college. I don't even know, like, I, I, I think that was one of those springboards into a great college experience is having those uh, summer programs that help you really make that transition better to ground your ground yourself in the type of study that you'll be doing. Uh, we got to like take test exam and take example courses, uh, tours of campus, and and we got to stay in the dorm so to get an idea of campus and make new friends. And it was just a really great experience. So the years following your freshman year, you get to come on as a peer leader. Uh, so uh, we both did that um, for a couple of years. Um, and it was great to be able to step into that mentorship role because, again, that was a very formative experience uh, for me. And and so that was really exciting. And as far as the volunteering, uh, I did a couple of volunteer roles, but that was definitely a key one. I was a, a in the inpatient oncology department. It was just called that, but it wasn't actually oncology. It was actually just a mixed use floor with all kinds of patients of with different uh, conditions that had them there. All, all kinds of stuff was happening. They just called it that because that's what it used to be. 
Uh, but but it was it was really exciting to kind of get that clinical exposure. And I think again, that was one of my first sort of steps into knowing, okay, I think I I don't think I belong on the lab. I think I belong somewhere more facing the community, facing patients. So that was a really eye-opening experience. They gave me like scrubs and stuff. And I got to uh, interview patients to see what their experience was and like satisfaction with patients and uh, got to do a little bit of shadowing. Uh, so it was, that was a definitely transitionary experience for sure. It was, it was great. It was at Greater Baltimore uh, Medical Center or GBMC. And, and that was a, a lot of fun. And highlighting just the importance of like that exposure to understanding like what you can do with this biology degree. And then like in that realizing like, is this really the route that I want to go and realizing like, ah, not, not so much. And I guess into that point, you, you became a research intern at University of Maryland School of Public Health. So yeah. I wanted to ask before you talk about that, that uh, internship, when, when did you know about the term public health? Like when, when did that come up for you? Was it was it because of this internship and it being at the Maryland School of Public Health, or would some, did something before kind of happen? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Like when I started to really solidify my understanding of public health, I would say hmm, there are probably times throughout the early years of my undergraduate degree that I was starting to be intentional about looking into what I actually wanted to do with it. If I'm remembering correctly about the timeline, I think for a long time I wanted to go into nutrition or like dietetics. Uh, so kind of, I think from there I started saying, okay, maybe epidemiology, and then maybe that's where the public health terminology started to come into into the space. So that was probably the end of sophomore year, the beginning of junior year, that I started to really say, okay, I think the public health direction. Now, as far as a personal definition, that's evolving uh, over time, of course, right, right. Even, even still to, uh, to this day. And um, But as far as my internship at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, uh, that one is one of those internships that like, that was a game changer. Like that was, uh, I'm saying like a lot, that was a, a game changing internship that um, definitely uh, made my footing very firm and like, I am doing this, like this is public health. Um, so uh, the program was called UM Star, uh, which I should know the acronym: University of Maryland Summer Training and Research. Um, and and they put a bunch of interns in a house together. We lived in a sorority house. And <laughs> imagine what that was like. Uh, we've been all, all great folks, and they're they're all doing such amazing things with an amazing, inspiring cohort of just wonderful, incredible scholars. And it really immersed you into this world of public health. Uh, now, I was not actually in um, what I am now, which is health equity, health outcomes, research type of work. I was actually in the wet lab. Um, they probably placed me in that because uh, I was a biology major, uh, but I was like doing PCR and DNA extraction and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, mm -hmm. man, <laughs> this ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure yet at that time. I, I was a biology major, so I was, I was like, okay. Well, let's see how it goes. But it, I, I like, I knew it was like, I, again, that was one of those experiences that just kind of affirmed. And sometimes doing what you don't want to do is exactly what you need. So you're sure what you do want to do, if that makes sense. And and I think that was that kind of experience where. Overall, the program was amazing. The program itself was amazing. There were so many great components. We had journal clubs, we had guest speakers, a lot of exploring of different public health careers and great mentorship. But my experience working in that lab, uh, yeah, it was it was definitely one of, and it wasn't even, it wasn't a bad experience. It just, I didn't like what I was doing. And I knew from that point on because the other interns were doing the kind of stuff I was doing. I just happened to get placed in that lab. Right. Uh, love the people, again, love the people. I just wasn't a pipette girly. I'm not a pipette girl. I'm not a genius <laughs> girl. I'm not a DNA in the lab type of person. Uh, and and I, I had to know that. I had to make sure of that because I probably would have kept going that direction just obligatorily uh, as a biology major. I, I probably would have felt obligated to explore that further, but that that helped a lot in understanding, you know, I want to ground myself more on the, on the social behavioral side of things. So uh, it was a great, great opportunity for sure. Yeah, that that speaks to everything. It's like, especially <laughs> in undergrad, uh, not knowing what you want to do, putting yourself in things that you think you may want to do or you think you may not want to do, like just to see like 
can I confirm that I don't want to do this? Or can yeah. I confirm that I do want to do this? Or like, just get in direction because it, 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 yes, it's four years of life, but it goes by pretty quickly in, in yeah. the larger scheme of things. And like getting those experiences and, and those exposures to, to all the different ways that you can apply what you're learning or like just understanding what direction you want to apply the, the research you're learning. And I think like, it's, it's awesome that you were able to be in the space and say, okay, I don't really like this PCR and all this like microbiology type stuff, but yeah. I like the social science research that those other people are doing. And I'm guessing like just being in the house yeah. and being around those interns helped you to kind of understand, oh, this is something that I can also do, yeah. um, So it, which is cool. And I think important for people, especially people in undergrad, especially for people in undergrad that don't know what they want to do, get yourself in a position so that you can learn different things and, and learn more about yourself and what you do and don't like. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then you have two two pretty cool internships here. So one was a health equity intern at the Maryland Department of Health, and the other one was a program intern at the Black Women's Health Imperative. Yeah. So t talk talk about those two internships that you had. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'll also group in another one um, that I was actually interning at in undergrad. So with Black and Women's Health Imperative, I wasn't working there until my master's degree. So if it's okay, okay. I can, can I table that until a little bit? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Um, so simultaneously, I was working at the Maryland Department of Health and a nonprofit called Susan G. Komen. Uh, and I was doing a health equity internship at, at both of those uh, entities and I, I think that uh, that was the first intern, those both, I was, it was uh, concurrently, those were both the ones where I'm like, this is it. This is what I meant. This is what I had in mind when I said public health. I think this is what I meant. Uh, so those were some really great experiences. At the Department of Health, um, I was in um, the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and I worked on a couple of projects. Now, both of these internships were the COVID semester, so they were cut in like half. So I unfortunately didn't get to see the end of the deliverables that I was working on. It just, everything fell apart, of, of right. course, the book was falling apart. Right. Um, but it was really cool to work on some Black History Month programming. Uh, there was an interfaith project that was going on with churches in, in, the, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Uh, so that was really great. Um, I'm trying to think what else we worked on. There was a pilot project about health and wellness that we worked on for like dietary that might have been a part of the interfaith i'm just trying to pull in my memories of that <laughs> and it was it was just a really uh eye-opening experience for sure uh, and it was also one of my first like going into the office corporate -y type of job so i i learned lessons <laughs> and i think it's, and I'll, I'll talk about this later too sometimes the biggest takeaway of, of some of those early internships isn't even necessarily what you did it's like lessons life lessons you learn so i learned that um wearing crop tops to a to a professional uh environment is not a thing i was in college so i was <laughs> like 20 or 20 mm -hmm. i might have been 21 and i didn't have like business casual clothes yet i only had like you know college girl type clothes so i never right. really thought of that my, my mom would have been so disappointed to have heard about that but i had really even that a whole lot of thought that you might want a different wardrobe depending on what kind of environment you're in. Now, of course, I, I might have some opinions on that, but but I, I get it. I, I completely understand. You know, you might not want your stomach showing at, at a, a Maryland Department of Health. I, I didn't know that before. And that was my biggest memory. My mentor at the time, uh, she was a black woman and she kept pulling me aside and saying, girl, you can't keep coming in here like that. She didn't say it. She said it more professional, but that's basically what she was saying. That, <laughs> oh, now, put your clothes on. <laughs> and I was like, what? I, and I felt like it wasn't that bad. It wasn't like, you know, a bandeau. It was just right. a, a little bit, a little bit too much for a corporate -y work environment. And, and that was an important lesson. And uh, a year later, I went on to like buy a whole bunch of, of businessy clothes, like what I'm wearing now. And I think that's now like more staple to my wardrobe. I don't even wear that kind of stuff half the time anymore. And um, I, th I think like those kinds of memories are things that you take away. Um, and my internship at Susan G. Komen, that was so beautiful. I loved my time there. And, and people have mixed thoughts about Komen because it, it, it is a nonprofit that um, 
uh, leans into capitalism a little bit. And, and I understand that. So I won't argue with people if they're like, no, I don't, I don't like home in. I, I've never been the type to be like, I'll stand on this hill. But I understand. But I, I absolutely loved it there. It was such a, a great experience. The people there were so warm and wonderful. And I'm a huge pink fan. <laughs> As you can see, I love the color pink. So I loved, loved it. And the mission was just absolutely so, so wonderful to to be advocating for more research towards and more resources towards breast cancer. Uh, and I was working on the African-American Health Equity Initiative, uh, which was addressing uh, breast cancer disparities that disproportionately impact African-American women. Uh, so that was just an amazing experience. But again, un unfortunately uh, with COVID, there were some things that I never got to do. They have this famous thing, it might have a different name now, but called the Race for the Cure. So we were supposed to go to Ocean City in April um, and, and there was just so much work to do. We we're going to go to hospitals to talk to stakeholders and um, uh, share some resources with uh, care navigators at different uh, healthcare facilities, working with federally qualified health centers. There was so much left that we had to do. And uh, as you as we all remember, uh, COVID just changed everything. But those were great experiences. And after both of them, I was like, sure, I'm going to go in this area of health equity and really, really, really affirmed that I was in the right place. Yeah, that, that is awesome. And I'm, I'm glad that you were able to get those two health equity internships, internships, sad that they had to end due to COVID. And like, I feel like that's always tough, not, not getting to see the deliverables or like getting to fulfill what you thought the end of this project looked like. And I could imagine that that might have been the case for a lot of people during uh, the, the pandemic, which is interesting in itself. And um, I, I, I empathize with that because I didn't have to deal with anything like that. And like just the challenges of being a student during the pandemic and institutions not being prepared to handle that transition, whether that is the internship side or the academic side. So feel it for you. Um, shout out to you for getting through that. Oh, um, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. all went through it. <laughs> right, right, right. The, the internship when you were in the house with everyone, and, yes, that was and you were UMD, yeah. Okay, UMD. Okay, I was right there. So you and and you're learning about like the social science research side of mm -hmm. things, as well as like now getting this health equity, these two health equity internships. That did that solidify like what you wanted to to do going forward, or like because at the beginning you're like biology, nutrition, and dietetics epidemiology maybe and then you learn more about public health so what what was your thought process like after these two internships these these three like uh, positions and rules in, in yeah. your thought process absolutely and i think one more and i know i did i did i always am doing a million things there's one more thing that <laughs> i think was really really important mm -hmm. and that was my role as a peer educator on campus i was in a program called diverse minds peer education program and i was the first lead peer educator and the mission of that group was to bridge the gap between uh, diverse identities and mental health. Uh, so we were working to dismantle stigma and to start those conversations with um, historically marginalized communities about talking about mental health and about kind of walking into mental wellness as college students. And we had events, we did trainings, uh, we did um, sessions. So I think that role was probably one of the most pivotal as well. As far as your question on, you know, Sorry, can you ask the question one more time? I just want to make sure I answer the right question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just asking, like, after all these experiences and yeah. this understanding of, like, research from a different perspective, did that solidify or, like, help you to, to like, figure out what your next steps were or, like, just yeah. think about what your next steps were? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, collectively um, they, they all kind of locked in my commitment to public health for sure. And looking at it through a health justice, a health equity lens, absolutely. I, I think I, I pulled that out of all of those experiences combined. Uh, as far as what I wanted to do next, I thought I wanted to do an MPH immediately after, uh, but I ended up uh, finding out about a post -bac program uh, through the NIH called uh, post Baccalaureate Research Education Program. And uh, they have multiple sites uh, nationally, and it's a paid program for one year where you get to kind of um, do science, <laughs> basically. Most of the sites are biomedical wet lab science, but I was very fortunate enough to get into the one site. This might not be the case anymore, but the, at the time, uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School had the only 
public health leaning program and it was clinical and population health. And I think that one was also a huge driver in health equity research. Uh, but but going back to undergrad, I think uh, definitely going into graduation and, and trying to figure out what was next, I felt very sure uh, based off those experiences. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I'm glad that you were able to take those experiences. So before we talk more about the post back, and I'm glad that they didn't put you in the wet labs again, but they put you on yeah. the public health side of things. <laughs> um, were there any undergrad takeaways that you wanted to share with like students that are in the undergrad right now? Yeah, sure. I had a recent conversation with, with someone about how undergrad, and I, th I think we talked about this now, just now in this conversation as well, at least for me, it, it, not really so much about what you learned in like that really hard class. Like, if you ask me to describe anything from advanced physiology or physics or even cell bio, which is core biology classes, I wouldn't be able to tell you where to start. I wouldn't know a thing. I don't remember. <laughs> because for me, undergrad was more about understanding who I am as a scholar, um, building healthy habits and, and growing as an individual. Uh, my brain grew so much. I absolutely needed that personal and social development. Because uh, I grew up very sheltered and uh, just finding my footing and setting up my um, compass uh, or my GPS for the rest of my life is, is my biggest takeaway from undergrad for sure. I love that. I can echo that because I do not remember a lot of the biology that I, that I took, no other chemistry and stuff. And yes, it, it is a lot about like the other aspects of college and university. And yeah. shout out to you for the the four best years of your life for now. Um, yeah, for now. Def yeah, definitely not peaking. Yeah. Definitely not peaking. Definitely no, not no. <laughs> Right, right. It's only the start. It's only the start. Yeah. Okay. So how, how did you learn about this post back position and then talk more about what you did in it? So again, I originally thought that I wanted to go the MPH route because I, I was starting to understand that a lot of public health careers, uh, you are going to want an MPH to transition into them uh, and to be able to grow in that role. Um, but it wasn't that I necessarily didn't feel ready, um, but I had also been thinking about something else, like maybe a post back. I, I don't even know where I got the term from. I just knew it was a possibility. Right. Uh, so my sister and I, uh, we both were looking into it. And I think my sister is the one who found the NIH version of this program, which is called PrEP. And I, I think we were both like, yeah, I think this is the right the right next step. So maybe in, um, it must have been October, September, October of 2019. So this is the first semester of my senior year of college. Uh, was when we started seriously looking into that and um, having like preliminary interviews with some of the faculty directors and uh, really giving that a lot of thought. And the applications were probably due in December um, and maybe January, maybe February, <laughs> between December and February, uh, that winter era, uh, and started hearing back uh, uh, in March. And of course, that's also when the pandemic was happening in 2020. Uh, so I didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen. There were some schools that didn't take anybody uh, out of the state. Um, there were some schools that pulled the program altogether. Uh, so um, we both had our fingers crossed that it would, it would work out. And I'm actually really fortunate that UMass is the only school I got into uh, for post back. I applied to a couple, I'm trying to remember, I think Case Western, Rochester, but they pulled the program, uh, VCU, but they uh, were only taking Virginia residents. And I was waiting for a very long time from UM Song. Uh, but I didn't even hear back from UM Song until June. And I had to decide wow. on UMass in April. So I didn't <laughs> even, I was just like, kind of, right. I can't really wait. I had to decide. Uh, and I'm really, really glad that that happened because if I had gotten into UM Song, they would have absolutely put me in a wet lab. But again, at that time, I, I might have just like said, okay, well, I guess I'll do it. But I, I like needed to, you know, trust myself that I knew that I needed to go this public health route. So the fact that I only got into UMass was a blessing. Uh, I guess I also probably would have tried to stay in Maryland because all oh, my family's here and there's so much more social support here. And I don't want to go to Massachusetts, but I didn't even end up going to Massachusetts because it was completely remote um, and because of the pandemic. So I never moved. So I won. I won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was, it was the best. It was absolutely amazing. And I loved my experience in the program. And that was my main exposure to the research part. Up until that point, it was all practice-based, kind of what I did at UM Star at UMD uh, was kind of research, but again, that was wet lab and I wasn't writing papers and it, it was a summer program. So it was more like just going through the motions, but I wasn't 
an actual research assistant. It was just a summer program. So my role as a postback researcher at um, UMass Med, I really got to sink my teeth into some projects and understand what research looks like uh, in a full scope manner. And I think that is uh, definitely that uh, experience that positioned me into being a health equity researcher. Uh, so that was a one year program and it was a funded program, so no loans. Uh, and if anybody wants to know more about it, uh, I'm happy to drop the link and and share some information about that for sure. But absolutely enjoyed my time. It was, a, again, a one-year program, so short. And I, I didn't even get to visit until years later. I didn't even get to go to Massachusetts until I went to a conference about a month ago. Um, but yeah, great experience and very important for, for my career. That, that sounds amazing. And yeah, please share the link. I will put it in the show notes so people can check that out. It sounds like it was it was meant to be that everything yeah. worked out oh. that way and like a win, win, win all around. And um, I can imagine that it, it probably solidified, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to do more of this. And then you you got your master's of public health in in uh, epidemiology at the University of Delaware. So tell us about that that transition from post back into thinking into about master's programs and then why you selected University of Delaware or like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So the post back program, the prep program, it is, uh, again, there was only, at the time, things might have changed. At that time, UMass Med was the only one that wasn't, I don't want to say hard science, I feel like we're phasing out that term, but uh, the only one that wasn't bench, like wet lab, uh, biomedical type science. So, but for the most part, they do expect prep scholars to transition into PhD programs in biomedical mm. science. And in the biomedical science discipline, you don't need a master's, usually, I mean, you if you do a post back, you don't need a master's. If you uh, still need more research experience, you might want to get an MS. Uh, but with that post back, you should need to get an MS and you can go straight into a PhD program. And that's what my sister did. Uh, but for public health, um, you're a little bit more limited if you apply to a PhD program without an MPH. Uh, there's a lot of programs that won't take you if you don't have an MPH. And I just didn't feel like I was quite there yet where I was ready to commit to a PhD level scholarship. I felt like there was more for me to do. There was more experience for me to build. Uh, and I, for that reason, I felt like an MPH was the right next step for me to kind of affirm the discipline. Because as we both know, public health has so many different disciplines. Like I'm doing epi, but I'm going to transition into social and behavioral sciences. And all my experiences have been social behavioral health equity. Uh, but again, I, my concentration was epi and there's, there's data, science, statistics, uh, so it, it is really important to make sure for a PhD, like this is what you want to do. Uh, and and it, I feel like public health is very uh, to its core, even if you are a researcher, it's very rooted in practice. So the more practice you can get, uh, practice-based experiences on the ground, on in the field, I think the better. And I, I wanted to take my MPH to do that. Uh, so that was my decision there. And and they were very supportive of that. Um, for choosing, by they, I mean uh, the people at UMass Med. And for choosing my master's um, at, at the helm of the decision was funding. I was very deep set on getting a full ride <laughs> and I was- Love it, love it. Yeah, you know, uh, and I was I was very blessed uh, to receive uh, the Graduate Scholars Award here at, at University of Delaware. And I'll probably say UD a couple of times, uh, which was, was extremely generous. And uh, I recognize that funding of that nature is not easy to come by for master's students. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, but beyond that, UD has been absolutely amazing. Um, I'll share that um, I did also receive acceptance into uh, what some might call elite institutions. Uh, like, and I'll, I'll name drop like Hopkins, uh, Yale, Brown, Cornell. And I, I did get a little bit of pushback from my family, like, girl, wow. Well, you can just take out some loans. We'll make it work. Like my family, like, we'll make it work. But nope, I was, <laughs> I wanted my full ride. <laughs> and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I never had that moment where I'm like, dang, I really picked UD. I've never had that moment ever. I never regret it. I prayed to be here at University of Delaware. I remember walking around my neighborhood uh, back, back in Frederick uh, when I was during the COVID. I was during the COVID, during COVID <laughs> uh, when I was with my parents uh, and I was walking around my neighborhood and just walking back and forth, just praying that I would receive that fellowship funding. Uh, and it is so worth it. My mentor, Dr. Yonda Cuffey, is is absolutely world-class. Uh, working with her has been nothing short of just incredible. And she's we're just so aligned in our interests and 
Uh, she's a fabulous mentor, a, a fabulous second mom. I love having second mom type mentors. Uh, and I knew as soon as I met her, I wanted to roll with her. And, and that's so important. That's very, very important. And something in my PhD journey, I, I learned is something I was truly blessed to be able to do. And my my department has been so incredibly supportive. It's a very nurturing atmosphere. And, and given that the MPH program at UD uh, is very new, uh, I think my cohort is going to be the third graduating class. Uh, we we all got to play a role in shaping the culture and setting the tone uh, for the program. We we aren't competitive against each other. Uh, we we all know everybody because it's relatively small, and we all just wanted to see each other win. Uh, and and as a whole, UD has so much to offer. Uh, it's it's so please to the viewers uh, don't underrate the flagship state schools they are the public schools like there are so many resources so many ways to get involved uh, there's so much vibrancy and, and so much energy from all the undergrads and the activity and there's just an incredible amount of diversity and commitment to community so i'm a huge supporter of public schools for public health absolutely and and uh, i really enjoy my time at ud absolutely Oh, thank you for highlighting that. And and I feel it, it goes to say, like, you make whatever your master's of public health program is and like the program doesn't make you. And to that point, like, shout out to you for choosing the program that fits you best, that that paid all the bills. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. That, yeah. and that also also is giving you like all the resources mm -hmm. and opportunities, because as we as we'll talk about in a little bit, you've you've taken on a lot of opportunities throughout your time in your MPH program. And it probably has made you just that much more holistic of a public health student, public health, health equity leader, aspiring public health practitioner out here. So uh, shout out to you for that, because I feel like that that is also a big a big part of like what makes the MPH is like what are the other things that you're doing to to actually use the knowledge and and skill sets that you're gaining and apply it and be able to speak to these experiences and uh, at least like I got a podcast so you can talk to these experiences and share share them with us so so I look forward to hearing more about that well thank you for sharing that no problem thank you for uh, you know allowing me to share more about it I'm a huge <laughs> always want to talk about University of Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a it's funny because my undergrad they i don't know if they do this it's so funny because okay so at towson my undergrad institution in in the year 2016 when i was transitioning at the orientation of freshman year they taught us to hate university of delaware so me going to university of delaware was like betrayal like at orientation they had us <laughs> you know chant together we hate those blue hands we hate them and we had to like it was a ritual and then I ended up going to University of Delaware. And one time I was invited to speak at like um, a presidential leadership council, which was such an honor to be able to, to speak there uh, with uh, some of the uh, kind of like board of trustees. I don't want to say it wrong, but it's kind of board of trustees type people. Mm -hmm. And I told that story and they're like, we don't, we don't, we don't, who? <laughs> <laughs> they're joking, but like, that's like, and I talk to people who are UD alums all the time and they're like, what i don't even we didn't even know there was a rivalship i didn't even know <laughs> <laughs> anyway love it. very, love very it. fun very fun so thank you love for it. letting me share <laughs> yeah 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 of course and and what one, one thing kind of tangential to getting into your master's of public health and experience so you said you and your sister did the post back program and i believe prior to hit and record you told me that your sister is doing uh mm -hmm. she's in is she's doing a phd in bio, biomedicine correct biomedical science yes mm -hmm. right so what 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 was like how how difficult was that for you to kind of like shift away from who and and like take in this public health like i, I want to understand that as well because you were saying we so that that definitely yeah, shows yeah, like yeah. how how intertwined like there, you there all was are. A, that's a great point i kind of think when did that happen where we started to realize hey i'm going that way you're going this way in terms of our directionality of our career so again for a long time i wanted to go into nutrition and dietetics and my sister for a long time wanted to go into genetic counseling. So for a while we had been kind of saying different things, but you know, in the trenches of undergrad, you don't even, you just kind of say stuff, and, but we were both plugging <laughs> it out in biology. We were both biology majors, all of undergrads. So we didn't start to feel mm -hmm. the shift happening until like the back end when I was starting to do internships and she was starting to do research as an undergrad at Towson. So we, again, we started to notice, but it wasn't that serious because we were still in the same classes. Um, so for our post-bac uh, year, I, we, we were intentional about 
we weren't intentional about it, but we didn't pick the same schools for our post bag. So that was sort of the um, the physical separation. That's when that happened. She went to Louisiana State University, the New Orleans campus, and she actually physically moved to Louisiana. And I was still in Maryland. I thought I was going to eventually go to Massachusetts, but again, my program ended up being entirely remote. Uh, but that was when it like kind of, okay, this is real. We had actually also both did summer internships separately. So when I was at UM Star at University of Maryland, she was in Alabama at Alabama A&M. So that was our, I guess, first, first separation physically, but like, that was only a summer and we didn't know it was going to happen after that. Uh, but we, we started to notice like subtle changes in, in our, in our interests as far as what we wanted to do. But I think it wasn't official, like, oh, wow, we Gonna, we're going to go different directions in our career until uh, the post back year. But honestly, we still have so much in common. <laughs> we're both very much so interested in DEI and equity. She has her own diversity organization at Penn State. And we talk about, you know, our, our shared interests and our shared experiences with having an organization and, and our commitment to DEI type of work. Of course, health equity and DEI are the same thing, but I'm also interested in DEI and social justice. So um, it we definitely still have a lot in common and we're both grad students. So it never feels like, Oh my gosh, that's so different. Um, mm -hmm. She like works with mice and stuff. And I, yeah, we, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that, definitely not. and it's actually kind of nice because we were never competing with each other for jobs. It was never like that. So I think that was also really healthy as well that we weren't actually like trying to apply for the same types of jobs. We right. had enough in not in common where it never felt like, competition between each other because that wouldn't have been healthy either but i don't think we would have ever been like that but still <laughs> yeah well thank you for sharing and, and i know before you're saying like she's your advisory committee and you're yeah. probably her advisory committee as well yeah. and i think yeah. that that is like very beneficial especially yeah. with both of you all being in like this this biology health space and then coming yeah. at it from different perspectives to, to be able to share those different perspectives with each other as you grow and like as you said they, they still have a lot of interest so um yeah shout out to you all <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so during your master's of public health program at University or UD, uh, you were the founding director for leaders in equity, access and diversity in public health at the university at UD, University of Delaware. Uh, you want to talk about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, uh, again, the program was very new. Uh, I was in the epidemiology, was, I still am in the epidemiology <laughs> program uh, uh, at University of Delaware. It's very new. So we didn't have a whole lot of organizations in existence uh, for students to come together uh, and, and share our visions outside of class. So I definitely identified that need. And I think that a lot of students were interested in health equity, were interested in community service, were interested in taking what we were learning in class a step further, step further rather. Uh, so I, I had a vision. I had been wanting to do this for a while, but I, I was like, Let me, let's do it. Let's, hey, let's make it happen. So uh, I remember kind of just sleeping on and trying to think of the acronym, the name, what was it going to be? Because, you know, we, we love our acronyms in public health and in science. <laughs> right. uh, so I, I think in a, in a dream, the name came to me, <laughs> Leaders in Equity, <laughs> Access, and Diversity in Public Health. And the mission of the organization is to create a community of scholars that are interested in advancing health equity and dismantling health disparities. And, and we do that through research initiatives, through community service, and through camaraderie building in the College of Health Sciences at the University of Delaware. Uh, and it's, it's open to grad students as well as undergrad students. And um, we fulfill that vision as far as in the research arm, we have an IRB approved study that is now active called Diverse Perceptions of Birth Giving Among College Enrolled Young Adults, uh, where we're gauging the opinions, the ideas, the thoughts, the emotions that young women and birth giving folks uh, feel towards the idea of having a baby one day or not having a baby or whatever their reproductive choices are. And that is through uh, interviews uh, that we will be qualitatively analyzing. And we've been, we started recruiting and we're in the middle of the interviews right now. And it's, it's been really, really a great experience to be able to PI. I've never been a, a principal investigator or anything. So it's my first experience uh, kind of designing a study from the very beginning, mm -hmm. uh, from the vision, from the mustard seed, all the way to now we're doing the interviews and it's happening. It's it's really, really incredible. Writing the IRB, uh, kind of the processes of the funding for it, like that whole process. And now I, I'm also the one that proctors the interviews and building a research team 
that has been such an awesome experience. And, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have been able to have the support to do that uh, from my colleagues as well as from my department. Uh, community service, uh, we recently had an event where we made sort of snack slash hygiene oh. kits. Uh, and we um, had like snacks um, and, and different hygiene items in the bags. And I took them to Blue Hand Bounty, uh, which is another place that I I'm also very involved on campus in some other organizations, including Black Graduate Student Association, Graduate Student Government. But one of the other ones that has been such a, a deep place in my heart is Blue Hen Bounty, which is our food pantry on campus. And being able to address food insecurity in that way has been such an honor. So we took the bags uh, to the, it's based out of a church uh, on campus and we took them to the church and, and they're gone now. So people definitely needed them. There was like 60 of them and they're all gone. And this was like less than two weeks ago. So it, it shows that people definitely uh, were happy to take them and and there's a need there. Uh, and they have like encouraging messages on them. And uh, it was it was really cool to be able to do that. And we also have gone to food banks. Uh, so it sounds like there's a food insecurity focus, which makes sense because that's something I'm passionate about. Uh, but uh, definitely that community service and camaraderie building. We had a diversity and public health mixer last semester. We want to do it again this semester do a little bigger and bring in a guest speaker, but that was great to be able to just kind of casually share over some pizza, our experiences and our how our identities, our social identities, how our lived experiences shape our journeys and our public health career. So that was a great conversation that we had um, last semester and hopefully again this semester, but it's been, it's been a really great experience and I'm hopeful to take the organization to my next school uh, and um, kind of grow, continue to grow it. I only got to be the, that, well, I guess I'll always, always be the founder, but I only right. got to be the director for one year because it only existed uh, in as of <laughs> spring, I guess, spring of 2022. What year is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> as of spring of 2022, uh, we became an official uh, registered student organization, um, but it, it's been an honor and I'm excited to do more work and do more leadership in this field for sure. I, I love that. I love like starting with just creating a peer space for people where you saw a gap for like equity leaders. And then it's amazing just to see like what that just starting that turning into a PI opportunity and having this entire research project that is going on. And like, I think to that point, it just shows leadership, it shows initiative as well as it shows like your willingness to put in this work to, to get and support communities that, that need the support at, and, and as a student as well, it's, it's not easy, especially while you're doing the other things that we're going to talk about in a, in a while. So, so sh shout out to you and like, um, like really, really big kudos for being able to take that on and just making, making it what it is. And I, I look forward to seeing like what it turns into. And yes, you should definitely take it to your, your, your PhD school. <laughs> yeah, I plan on it. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. It's, it's an honor and I'm blessed to be able to do it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay, so you tabled this a little bit earlier, but you were a program intern at the Black Women's Health Imperative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would love for you to chat more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, tracing a little bit back to my post-back year. So during uh, the events that were happening in the summer of 2020 regarding uh, the racial reckoning and the sort of resurgence and climax of the Black Lives Matter movement, I really was taking steps to get serious about health equity and what work was I going to do in Black health specifically? Uh, so I was already looking for volunteer opportunities. I wasn't looking to get paid. I was living at home at the time, so I, I was good uh, with, with my, my payment for my post back program at the time. So I wasn't looking to get paid. I was looking for volunteer experiences that could really strengthen my grounding in advancing Black health. So I think I had already maybe heard about Black Women's Health Imperative just through the grapevine, LinkedIn, uh, but I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta do some work with these folks. So I, I just cold messaged, uh, the direct, one of the directors, I, I didn't exactly know her role at the time, uh, but she went on to be my boss. Uh, her, her name is John A. Epps and, and she, um, at the time was the director of the, my sister's keeper program, uh, which is a, a sort of sub program of black women's health imperative for young women, young black women aged 18 to 30. So I messaged her. Again, I didn't exactly know her role. I just knew she worked there and she was in a leadership position. I just pulled messaged her on LinkedIn. And I was like, hey, uh, what's up? <laughs> can, I, can I be involved? And Black Women's Health, of course, I didn't say it that way, but uh, I, I sent her a very professional message uh, to express my interest in uh, being involved with Black Women's Health Imperative in either an unpaid intern or volunteer capacity. Now, of course, uh, we, we both know the 
uh, sort of challenges of, of taking unpaid internships for, in general. Uh, but again, I was in a, a very uh, privileged position to have already had paid work, but wanted to supplement my paid work uh, with volunteer experiences. So uh, I, I wasn't asking for money. I was just asking for exposure and an opportunity to collaborate uh, in a volunteer capacity. And she was very warm to it. We set up a call. And the rest was kind of history. I joined the internship team uh, that summer, which was very large uh, at the time. Uh, there were lots of interns from Morgan State and um, maybe Howard. There might have been some other schools, but a lot of Morgan State folks uh, that were there doing their practicum and, and things like that. So we, we got to work together on a lot of projects. And then slowly it started to trim down. Uh, I think uh, things changed and, and focus has shifted, but it ended up being me, uh, the program coordinator who I love, Bill Keese. Uh, and John A, and as well as our RJ, uh, RJ, I um, can't remember her role was director or coordinator, but Bria Johnson, uh, all amazing people. And uh, we did so many wonderful projects for Young Black Women's Health. I got to travel, <laughs> I got to go to New Orleans uh, for the Black Kings and Queens or Black Royalty for HBCUs conference, which was such an amazing opportunity. I got to engage with Truth Initiative uh, for their menthol convening. In September, which later transitioned to where I am now. Uh, so, hey, you never know, something might happen and things transition. Uh, but it was great. We got to do so much really, really insightful and very culturally tailored programming uh, from reproductive justice, the reproductive justice cohort, which was a training program, the MSK Academy, which had different topic areas like emotional well being, um, the Heart Health Program, which was a major initiative. And probably many other things that I'm blanking on. So sorry to be a PWHI <laughs> folks that see this, but it was really, really excellent. And I mainly supported social media, but also uh, helped support some of the programming as well. Uh, so it was it was just amazing. And I, I it really solidified my commitment uh, to Black women's health. Um, so great, great memories. <laughs> That, that's amazing. And I, I think it just goes to show like you never know what a LinkedIn message or an yeah. email can can get you and the opportunities and connections like just talking about the, the link from being able to do this work because you wanted to volunteer and you wanted to support as an, as an intern in, in, in this role and then being able to go travel and experience different like experiences while you're doing this work and touching a lot of different programs yeah. and get connected to these different networks and from that be able to become a youth trainer for the truth initiative which is a current role that you have and since we're already talking about it do you want to just talk a little bit about what you do as a youth trainer yeah i actually just started so i might not have as much to say about this one but that's a very recent uh occurrence it it, it turns out as i was transitioning out of bwhi that role began, so it was just it was totally seamless, uh, which was a blessing. Um, but um, we're going to be doing work in uh, helping address the the use of vaping and the use of flavored menthol uh, in uh, tobacco products and how that impacts youth and young adults, uh, and and trying to really uh, advocate for uh, smoking secession as well as legislation that makes some of these. Uh, these qualities of these vapes, that the flavors that make it taste good, that make it fun, uh, uh, advocating for legislation uh, that that changes that that tone and and makes addiction not cute. <laughs> uh, so that's the work that we're going to be doing in in, in uh, engagement with high school students, middle middle school students, um, with different organizations, different entities. We actually have the moment of action coming up. Well, we'll be on the ground uh, doing some of this work in DC. So I'm super excited. And we also also address that in a health equity lens as well, where menthol cigarettes have been uh, intentionally adversely, or rather intentionally disproportionately uh, advertised uh, to African-American communities for decades. And it's, it's that way by design. And now we see these outcomes in terms of lung cancer mortality, uh, and other smoking related morbidities that are disproportionately impacting African Americans. Uh, so that's also an element of the work that really got me engaged in, in being able to ground that in policy is something that I don't usually get to do as a researcher. Uh, so I'm really, really excited about it and, and excited to engage with youth and young adults to get them involved in, in making tobacco that's old school. We don't even talk about that anymore one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and that's awesome. And, and that's, that was the point that I was going to highlight, that you're getting to like take this research and put it into action in, in the yeah. sense of like shifting policies and getting policies passed to to not only like fix like just behaviors, but 
have those big systems shift in ways that can really leverage and impact a lot of people at one point in time. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. And I look forward to seeing like how that rule uh, evolves. <laughs> awesome. And uh, so you are also an associate student contributor at the Public Health Millennial and as well as a young adult mental health and community health trainee at Mohawk School of Medicine. Do you talk about those two positions? Sure. Uh, yeah, so my role with you, so I was previously in an organization, organization called Groundbreakers, uh, which was a, a small nonprofit based out of DC, and I was uh, on the racial equity team, and I got to engage with people like you as we were building out uh, a racial equity guidebook. I'm not actually sure what happened uh, after uh, I departed that organization uh, with that project, but I got to meet people like you, uh, and uh, if I remember correctly, um, after writing uh, a blog post about your work, uh, you invited me to to come and join your team, and I've I've been so excited to be a part of this work with Public Health Millennial. I obviously I already had heard of it because I asked you to to be on on the blog for Groundbreakers, uh, right. so to now be a part of it, it's like whoa! And it, it goes to show again, LinkedIn is powerful. Just don't ignore it. Uh, I'm I I would say that I'm on LinkedIn more than I'm on Instagram. Uh, so definitely, it's a, a powerful tool, and uh, I get to talk with other young leaders in health equity about their interest in health equity and, and what they want to do with their careers, which has been so, so fun. It's been, it's been a joy uh, to talk with people and do these interviews. And I do write-ups uh, that are posted on uh, the Public Health Millennial platform under the Emerging Change Maker Zone. And it's been fun to do that. I'm working on one right now. <laughs> um, and I'm going to have that out this weekend. Uh, finally, or have that out to you rather, <laughs> or drop to you uh, this weekend. Uh, and, and that's been great. And as far as the program at Morehouse, uh, I, I saw that on LinkedIn <laughs> um, and it's the youth, the young adult mental health and community health training program. And that's been really interesting as well. Um, it's a series of a, a bunch of modules. It's kind of like a course uh, in many different topics in community health, uh, from mental health to physical health, uh, to qualitative study design, motivational interviewing, uh, understanding many layers of social determinants of health from green space uh, all the way to environmental justice. We have all these wonderful uh, modules in uh, a platform called Canvas. If you're a student, you know the vibes or Blackboard, it's similar to that. Um, and we're, we just finished up the learning phase. We get to learn how to use blood pressure monitors, uh, learning how to uh, assess health of, of our community members, of family members, and we're going to get an opportunity to track their health and design our own example intervention uh, with a focus on youth and young adults. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. That That is a paid program as well. Uh, so again, keep your eyes peeled for these uh, training programs, cohorts. They're out there. <laughs> it's really exciting. Yeah, and I think it speaks to the power of just being on LinkedIn, using LinkedIn as a tool. Yeah. And and like from, from my perspective, like you reaching out to write that article of me was like at the same time that I was thinking about asking people to come on to the public health millennial and write. So it was kind of like a perfect fit. Like, oh, this person likes to write already. So it's like <laughs> so it's a natural fit. And yes, I, I'm I'm glad that you're able to to capture the stories of young health equity change makers or emerging health equity change makers and share their stories and while you're also like building out your skill set and your network while you're doing that which is all all awesome mm -hmm. and shout out to you for that other the morehouse school of, of medicine uh work that you get getting to do there it sounds like it's very encapsulating of a lot of different uh knowledge bases and, and skill sets that that you can mm -hmm. apply in, in various ways so that's awesome and on, on LinkedIn, are there like specific pages that you follow? You just like follow people and then it just kind of pops up on your timeline? Yeah, I just connect with people. If they're like doing research that's relevant to what I'm interested in, I'm never afraid to send a quick invite. If, if they, Sometimes it'll prompt you to like, hey, hey, this person doesn't know you. Please send a note. So yeah, do that if you're like they're a total stranger <laughs> and they're completely out of your network. But yeah, I just add people and you'll just... As, as, as far as how LinkedIn works, you see what friend of a friend type of thing, how what right. they posted, what they posted. And yeah, it shows up that way. It's really, really, really a great platform. Yeah. And that, that, that's the power of LinkedIn and having like people connected to you is that if they like or comment on something, you're going to see it in your timeline. Mm -hmm. So just having people that interact on LinkedIn as your connections and interact with things that are useful to public health and health equity and your career growth, I think is just very, very helpful. So mm -hmm. yeah, def definitely awesome. 
you have a couple of positions at UD, University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Two of them you currently do, one you used to do. So you were an, in, you were an intercultural engagement student leader, and mm -hmm. you currently are a social justice peer educator and a graduate research assistant. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Sure. The intercultural engagement student leader role. Uh, so there's a new center at the student center. Uh, so kind of like the main hub where students come together to eat and study in some of the offices. Uh, on one of the floors, they're building a center for intercultural engagement, which will be uh, housing some of the offices for different affinity groups on campus, including the Black Graduate Student Association, which I am the secretary for. Um, and it'll be a, a, a collaborative space to share culture, a safe space uh, for people of different marginalized identities to come together and just um, have a place to study, have a place to relax, have a place to unwind between classes. Uh, some events and, and different things like that. Meetings will happen there, convenings will happen there. Uh, so they need a team of advisors to help uh, shape the vision of the center as far as visually what it would look like, the features, the square footage, all the details. We got to see all the schematics and uh, help pick the furniture, uh, all that kind of stuff we got to play a role in. So that was really cool. Uh, and, and that definitely kind of helped me get my footing into student diversity and inclusion. I know earlier I said I, I'm also very interested in, interested in DEI, which isn't the same thing as health equity, uh, but definitely uh, they're, they're relevant uh, to each other and they're interconnected. So that is how I heard about social justice peer educators. Uh, now, similar to my peer education role back in undergrad, where we get to engage with students, different organizations, fraternities and sororities, offices, different um, different campus entities, and uh, majorly the freshman year seminar. I think most schools have something like that at Towson. It was called Towson Seminar. Uh, but first year, like first semester students, they have to take this class where they just get an intro to college. And uh, that was one of the components of the class. We got to go to different uh, FYS classes to uh, teach them a kind of an intro to social justice and interest, an intro to diversity, equity, inclusion. So being able to engage uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer level uh, with the future leaders of the world is something that I'm honored to be able to do in that capacity. And it's great to, again, take the work beyond writing a paper and presenting at a conference, but getting getting on the ground and, and talking to people about, you know, about racial equity. It's really important about equity beyond and beyond race. I don't want to uh, restrict it to race alone, but but very, very important work across the board. And then as far as my role as a graduate research assistant, again, I work with Dr. Yonda Covey, and she is um, the PI of a study called High Blood Pressure Stories, uh, which is a digital storytelling intervention. Uh, in it, we're, we're kind of showing African-Americans in Delaware videos of other African-Americans telling their story about hypertension, how they manage it, how they found out uh, what their journey means to them and what their advice is to other folks like them. Uh, and we're kind of seeing Hey, what do other people think of these videos? Are they helpful? Do they are they powerful? Do they motivate uh, other African Americans? Because in the Black community, storytelling is is powerful. Sometimes the doctor telling you don't do this, and uh, sort of looking into medical mistrust and how that that mm -hmm. is uh, an important uh, challenge for the African American community, uh, or rather barrier. Uh, looking at interventions that that kind of work around that and, and use neighborhoods, use family, use community care. Uh, is something that it's it's really interesting to be able to do that. So getting to go out to the community, do recruiting, um, and really engage with folks uh, to bring them into that work uh, has been sort of the core of my experience as a GA, uh, and su super exciting. <laughs> All great. Yeah, that, that's yeah. That, that is that is awesome, and like just being able to, as you said, like engage with people in the community and get your feet on the ground, and really, and, and I think that kind of talks to like your position as a youth trainer because it seems like. From there, you're, you're getting the insights from those students and then using those insights to kind of elevate their voice to that advocacy platform to mm -hmm. kind of change the systems around them. So, yeah, very, very relevant uh, overall. And uh, that, that that's really cool. And um, so you also work as a health equity research associate at yes. MedStar Health. So <laughs> share, share about that position. Ooh, that you I was have. a little worried, like, oh, that's an important one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that is a similar uh, startup to BWHI, where I was on LinkedIn and I was like, I want to find someone to work. <laughs> I'm not going to apply. I'm just going to ask. Uh, and at this time, again, it was a, in a volunteer capacity. I just wanted more experience. Uh, so um, I emailed who became my boss. Her name is Dr. Delia Wesley, and she is one of my biggest inspirations. So, so actually what happened, I emailed them way, way, way back in 2019, because 
back then I was, I was actually just in college and wanted to volunteer places. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'd already volunteered at GBMC in a hospital setting. So I was, at the time I was looking for something similar to that. I didn't, wasn't even in research at that time. Uh, but I think it just got lost in the sauce, COVID, you know, something like that. Uh, so at the end of 2021, I was like, okay, well, let me try one more time. Cause I was actually really interested in, in getting to, getting to know some of the folks there. Uh, so I messaged Delia on LinkedIn and she was like, oh yeah, sorry about that. I remember your, I remember seeing your resume. Sorry, you fell through the cracks. Uh, email this person, like the administrative director, uh, Amy Will, and uh, they brought me in that way. And so I started out as a volunteer uh, in the Center for Health Equity Research. And uh, in probably a couple months later, they wanted to bring me on in a paid position. So I'll also say that as some advice. And I know there's a question later about advice, but that's another advice that sometimes volunteer roles will turn into a paid position uh, that, that happened at BWHI as well, where I started as a volunteer and eventually they they began to pay me. Uh, so do good work and, and they'll invite you to stay. Uh, of course, not always, but they might. <laughs> so uh, that was really great. And I still am at MedStar. Uh, and we do so uh, such a huge array. And I think that's why I've, I've evolved to be a multi-outcome person. Uh, we do uh, a lot of focus in women and infant services, uh, perinatal reproductive health. Uh, our biggest great, our biggest grant is Safe Baby, Safe Moms, uh, which is about addressing uh, maternal and child health inequities, uh, as well as prenatal and perinatal health inequities in the DC region. Uh, so I've gotten to be a part of implicit bias trainings all the way to some exciting products that are happening now in terms of social determinants of health and uh, postpartum depression screening, diabetes in the prenatal period, maternal medical legal partnerships, department climate, department trainings, patient provider communication. We did some digital health. Uh, we've done substance addressing substance use disorder and, and qualitatively interviewing uh, uh, mothers and uh, pregnant people and their caretakers and different uh, stakeholders in terms of their experience with substance use disorder and definitely some things that I've, oh, I got to write my own paper on uh, hypertension in, in the Black community as well. Uh, and I presented something recently uh, at the American Heart Association that was with UD, uh, but definitely there's there's so many amazing projects happening. There's so many more community advisory boards. Uh, we're, we're just really building out the center uh, and, and very hopeful about the role that it's going to play in health in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. But but yes, that's a, a big role for me. And I, again, a huge shaper in my interest in health equity research. Absolutely. <laughs> key message there as well, like follow up, you never know oh, what falls yeah. through the cracks and, <laughs> and what, what that message can mean. But I also love the perspective of like being a multi-outcome person yeah. or multi-outcome public health mm -hmm. professional, because that's important because so many issues, quote unquote, uh, intersect mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, there's just so much overlap. So understanding that like, we need to focus on, on multiple things. Yeah. Like, so I guess some people might push back on that, but I, I will say that that is important in like a, a systems level perspective to focus on those intersections of the issues, because that's where the, the actual change is. And when you look at organizations, many graduate organizations, they don't work in one issue. They work in across multiple issues that affect their communities. And these are the organizations that are impacted most by the issues that surround us and have not been given a chance to have the solutions or let their voice be raised up to the solutions or be part of the conversation. So yeah, love, love that, love that. And I uh, look forward to seeing like where that role takes you and uh, where, where you go afterwards. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I think that's all out of my work. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just all. That's just all. But yeah, that's, that's all, all amazing work. And, and I know that you're, you're wrapping up your MPH program currently mm -hmm. and you are pursuing a PhD program. Mm -hmm. When, when did the idea of pursuing a PhD program come, come to you? Cause I know earlier you said that you, you weren't sure if at first you were like, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to do my, my, my MPH. You got the post back, did your MPH and you said, because you weren't ready to go straight into a uh, PhD type program. So when, when did the PhD come up and like, what, what's the thought process there? And you don't have to share about the exciting news that you do have to, that you are going to share soon, but, but uh, let, let us know what that thought process. Yeah, absolutely. So my mother actually has a doctorate degree. Uh, she has a doctorate of management. 
Uh, and she was working towards that when, when my sister and I, and I also have a brother. Uh, so she had three kids that were minors when she was pursuing uh, this degree. So seeing her work towards that and, and she had a lot of sleepless nights, I'm telling you, it was rough on her, but seeing her achieve that goal at such a young age was very shaping for me and my interest in education. Uh, so I think that there is a sort of light that was ignited by my mom and seeing her do that. Uh, it's just something that kind of ignited a fire in me that that I, I knew I, I always knew that I wanted to do a doctorate degree uh, because of that inspiration. So I'm, I'm very thankful to my mom for that. But as far as uh, more specifically in my career, um, I, I really see myself uh, being a researcher and, and again, be, beyond uh, the paper, but really taking it to another level. Uh, and I, I found in, in my journey through public health, uh, which again, to, to date has been very dynamic uh, from lab to the nonprofit space, academia and, and beyond, uh, that, that research and knowledge building are such critical vessels to understanding and addressing how injustice influences our lives, right? And, and getting to the core of that why statement, why do these inequities happen? How can we fix them it is an area of work that I feel myself feeling is, is the most me. <laughs> uh, and this is the most true to my story. So uh, as I've grown in my work uh, as an aspiring health equity researcher, uh, I, I guess I found that I've, I've grown into my work uh, as um, in understanding barriers to care seeking, uh, healthcare utilization, uh, pat perceptions, patterns of health. Uh, and I'm specifically interested in adolescents and young adults. Uh, what, what can we do in this early portion of this life course to ensure that young people uh, aren't going before it's their time to go, uh, specifically young marginalized people who inevitably it will happen to more as a result of the consequences of oppression in the United States. Uh, and I'm excited to engage in research that would hopefully at the end of my career, I can look back and, and know that I contributed to uh, the longevity of marginalized folks and that not being an anomaly, uh, and, uh, but, but a reality, right? And, and to me, that's core to wanting to pursue my PhD. I wanna have extensive training in conceptualizing questions, designing studies, um, translating findings into, I guess, programming and policy. Uh, so, so I'm able to sit as, at as many tables as possible and make any new tables uh, uh, when that's possible and, and all, all in the name of improving the lives of communities that are otherwise forgotten. So that's my motivation for wanting to do this work on a doctoral level. <laughs> Yeah, very mission driven, and uh, I like I like the perspective of it. Just wanting to to be able to know how you can, well, positioning positioning yourself in the best place that you see possible to affect change and to be able to step into these rooms and not have people question you. And and if you realize that I want to impact these issues in a big way, and I've seen through my conversations and everything that the the best way for me to position myself to do that without people question or with people having the least amount of questions while also developing my skill sets to be most effective at doing the work that I want to do that's going to impact the communities that need it the most going the PhD route makes sense for you. And, and I love that for you. And I look forward to seeing like what, what that journey looks like and unfolds and the best four years of your life is going to be sometime far, <laughs> far down the road yeah. when, when all those impacts and the work that, that you've been working on from now to then all culminate, culminate. And yes, we do have healthier, more whole, um, communities. So I appreciate that. I sure hope so. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. And so you kind of spoke to like where you'd like to see yourself in the future generally, but is there anything else you'd like to add to that or should I just move on to the Furious Five? Um, well, I, I guess I can expand a little bit on it. I, I'm actually not sure. that into a title. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm leaning more in, in towards industry and nonprofit, like a director of health equity type of role, but I haven't totally ruled out academia. Although it seems that um, uh, people are saying run. <laughs> Don't do <that>. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of awesome to have my own lab and write my own grants and mentor students. But I'm listening to people when they say stay far away from academia. So I'll uh, so I'm going to take my PhD years to think about that and right. see where I land in a couple of years. But 
most certainly uh, positions that center me in health equity research, practice, and policy. Uh, I, I really want to be uh, actively involved in the idea phase, the grant writing phase, to the research design phase, all the way over to the implementation, the programming, the advocacy, the legislation phases. I, I want to be a health equity leader uh, that's, I guess, grounded in service and in, in justice uh, through and through. So I'm currently open-minded as long as that's my daily routine. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Um, I think just like going, working towards a mission more so than a position is important. And I hope that you keep that grounding of like advocacy and policy in the work that you're doing, because we need that. We need that. So just, just sharing that from my perspective. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. So moving on to the Furious Five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Yeah. Actually, is it okay if I combine this question? I'm just looking at it right now. Is it okay if I combine this one and the next one? Because I think those yeah. are important yeah. answers. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and the second one is if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so for uh, both uh, my position and public health in general, definitely prioritizing gaining a, a vast array of experiences. So do internships, volunteer engage in activities, events, opportunities to network, and, and don't be afraid to try out different roles simultaneously. As we talked about for years, I've held positions at the same time. <laughs> Obviously, that I, those aren't concurrent. Those aren't sequential. Those are all happening at the same time often. Uh, and, and I feel like that's key to growing a large experience base at a young age. And mm -hmm. I think it's critical to be very intentional uh, or having a very intentional uh, tenacity for gaining experience while you're in school. Uh, don't wait until, uh oh, it's senior year. Um, I need an internship. Oh, don't wait that long. <laughs> Go ahead and get started like sophomore year, junior year. And of course, to the extent that you're able, uh, of course, be mindful of burning yourself out and your mental health. Absolutely. Uh, but, but on that note, I feel like in, in my career, I, I really genuinely, uh, love everything that I do. Uh, so it usually doesn't feel like I'm working per se, like trudging into the office and doing it, clocking in, clocking out. I'm not trudging into signing in, like other than, of course, like the sleepiness of just starting the day. <laughs> uh, but it, it really is true. It's so true that when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I still don't feel like, oh my God, ew, nine to five corporate and I know not everybody has that privilege where they have so much flexibility in their schedule. So I definitely want to lift that. Uh, but I, I absolutely feel like, you know, it, it's so important to to land in a, in a field where you love it. Uh, so it doesn't feel so labor intensive. But it, if it does, it's a labor of love. Absolutely. Uh, and again, I, I landed in health equity in, in the back end of undergrad. Uh, I started out in biology, right? Uh, so explore, explore early and prioritize finding that fire so that you can find your destiny place. Love it. Love it. Love it. Great, great advice. And, uh, yeah, definitely take, take that on. And especially the, the point about like just building experiences as a young professional, like if, if you want to build vast experiences, you're going to have to take on concurrent things and just understanding yeah. that, that that's just what it takes at that point in time. But yeah, mm -hmm. beautifully said. And, uh, thank you for sharing. So number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, having grace with myself and trusting my own knowledge of what's best for me. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, share that I historically have been a, a little bit of a self-sabotager. Sabotager, is that a word? And a little bit of a self-gaslighter, uh, only with myself, not other people. Uh, but, but I deserve that self-support and that kindness that I show to others uh, toward myself and the decisions that I make in my life. So I'm feeling that development happening in, in this era of my life. Love it. Love it. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you're working towards that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, oh, it says like a book, podcast. <laughs> I actually don't have any like public health media like books or podcasts or YouTube channels that I specifically recommend. Though of course there are absolutely some great resources out like <laughs> millennial. Uh, but I'll say that when I'm reading, I love to kind of unplug from 
work. Uh, that's, I guess, a little bit of work-life balance. So I love to read like young adult, like teen fiction, which might sound like, what? You're grown. Uh, but, but no, it's a way to like reconnect with your inner child. Right. Uh, I was such an avid, ver- avid, avid bookworm in my adolescence and my teens and, and reading like that fiction uh, just gives me a little piece of nostalgia, I guess, in connection with the youth fountain. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. And definitely check out Health Equity Changemakers under the Public Health Millennial, what Usley writes, because that is definitely something that she should have recommended that she did not. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I <laughs> right, right, right. Let's be specific. <laughs> and and are, are there and are there any fiction books that that you'd recommend? One one that really stands out. Yeah, I just finished a book. Well, just like in January, um, called <laughs> "Not So Pure and Simple." I should know the author, author, but that's what it's called. Uh, it was a great read. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. And I'll, I'll link that for anyone that's interested in detaching from public health and just reading something that is a little more lighthearted. Um, awesome. And then number five, last but not least, where can people connect with you? Yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, for sure. Same name, Ashley McCullers. Uh, I, I don't have a super influencer type presence on Instagram, but you're welcome to request to follow me. Uh, it's at Mahogany Princess, which I assume will be linked at, uh, as well and i share a lot of my work on my instagram story uh quite often so uh you can check me out there awesome thank you and i'll be sure to link those so that people can connect with you but thank you so much for sharing your insights your story your developing aspirations and work as a public health health equity practitioner and researcher thank you so much i was so so honored to be able to share and i really appreciate it yeah, tr- truly is my pleasure. I look forward to seeing your career growth. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of your journey. Yay, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> my pleasure. Housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet. Leave a like, leave a five-star review, and share this with a friend. It greatly helps the show get out to more people and helps other people understand what they can do in public health and just understand public health better. Appreciate your peace. Thank you.